Dream. I'm really excited about this one because it's about the symmetry of music theory. And so, uh, yes, Dave Mercer, we're totally going to geek out. And this is so fundamental that it's kind of surprising that it is even possibly like a like a niche topic. It's like if you were to study physics and someone were to mention gravity and and the person, you know, who's saying, hey, I, I understand physics. Uh, what's gravity? I've never heard of that. That would be like someone who's into music saying, oh, music's geometric. That's a novel idea. Uh, by the end of this, you will see what we're talking about and why that should not be novel, why it is so fundamental to music theory that just everybody needs to know it. So let's jump right in. And uh, as always, if you're part of the replay crew, let us know where you're coming from. And we are going to talk the symmetry of music. Now, a lot of times I talk about the fact that music is geometry. Music is geometry. We're not talking getting out a protractor and calculating the hypotenuse of a triangle, but it is geometric shapes. They're uh, symmetrical geometric relationships between notes that inform the formation of scales and chords and progressions. And it's one thing to say that music is geometry, but let's break it down to the fundamental symmetries of music. And there are three basic symmetries that show up at the, the most fundamental, basic, foundational level of music theory. And they provide this framework upon which everything else builds. So uh, instead of just waving my arms, I'm going to share an image and let's jump into it. Okay, so the just the thought of saying that music is symmetrical or that it's geometric might seem counterintuitive if you're used to seeing diagrams like this. Certainly, all of these man-made blotches and squiggles of traditional notation don't reveal this symmetry. Uh, and you might kind of get a sense with different chords that uh, maybe there's, you know, what could hint at some patterns going on, but it still doesn't look symmetrical, that's for sure, and maybe not really geometric at all. So if you were to look at music theory through the lens of traditional symbols like this, this symmetry is lost. It's hidden. But when you actually look at what's going on beneath the surface, it'll make sense. Now, just to step back here for a moment, the difference between music and noise is that noise is chaotic sound. There isn't any rhyme or reason to it. There's no structure to it. Whereas music is ordered sound. But when we say order, what does that mean? Because or order is just kind of like a, a general statement. Uh, how what what does this order look like? And it is geometry, but even more basic than that is symmetry. S symmetry is ordered. There's a predictability to it. There's a uh, a cleanliness to it, and that is what distinguishes music. From noise. So again, if you look at traditional symbols like notation, finger charts, whether it's for a piano or you have uh, guitar charts, it's the symmetry is not really standing out. So like I say, there are three fundamental types of symmetry and we're going to go through each one and see how they appear in music and how they inform music at its most important atomic levels. You have translational symmetry. And like I said, we'll explain each of these in turn. Then there's rotational symmetry and reflectional symmetry. And I'm using the letter P here because the letter P itself is not like it doesn't have mirror symmetry. A lot of times people think of reflectional symmetry as the only type of symmetry. Like if you look at the 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 human body, you know, I'm, I'm symmetrical. I have this symmetry down the middle. It's a, like the down the middle is mirror symmetry. And so a lot of times I think it's easy to think of symmetry as just that one type, but there are different types of symmetry and they all show up in music in a really beautiful, elegant way. So like I say, translational symmetry is the first one. And what that means is you just take a pattern, P in this case just means pattern, and you have these lines of symmetry that it's not reflected, it's just repeated across these lines and you can just keep repeating down the line. That's translational symmetry because translation to translate it is to move it. So this is translational symmetry. We'll see what that looks like. Then you have rotational symmetry, which 
is a little more familiar where it's just you're pivoting around a central point. Again, there's no mirror symmetry in that this P or this pattern is just, it's being repeated, but around a central pivot point. And then you have reflectional symmetry, which is mirror symmetry. And that's, this is where the pattern is reflected across a middle, a middle line. So let's start with translational symmetry. And this one is the one that, uh, to me anyway, when, when I thought of symmetry, I didn't even really know what translational symmetry was. This doesn't even seem like symmetry in the traditional connotation of the word, but it is a type of symmetry and that's where we're going to begin. So let's start with the, what are called tetrachords or little four note segments of music. And if you take, let's say this whole, whole half, so it's supposed to be a, an H for half, you have the first part of a C major scale, C, D, E, F. And then you have this translational line of symmetry and you repeat that pattern again, whole, whole half. Those are really squiggly uh, H's, W's and H. Let's try that again. So you have the first part, C, D, E, F, and then G, A, B, C. This tetrachord pattern of whole, whole half is repeated, it's translated from one segment to the next. And then if you take, you put in another, uh, you know, a line of translational symmetry and you repeat that whole, whole half, you get, you start with G, A, B, C, and then play the next tetrachord or four note sequence of D, E, F sharp, G. So again, this tetrachord, now, Chord, not in the sense that of like a triad or a major chord where you play the notes simultaneously. Tetra just means four and chord means pattern in this case. It's a four note pattern. And if we take, we insert another line of translational symmetry and we repeat that pattern of whole, whole half, then we get the second half of the D major scale. So it's D, E, F sharp, G, and then A, B, C sharp, D. And because this translational symmetry is repetitive, we could continue with, with that same pattern. So this is more abstract view. So we're not looking at the black and white keys of a keyboard, but we're looking at just the, the pattern of whole steps and half steps. We have one tetrachord that is repeated across the line of translational symmetry, another tetrachord, another line of translational symmetry, another tetrachord, another tetrachord, another tetrachord, and you could keep going uh, to the point where if you just keep going, it turns into this loop of tetrachords that is also known as the circle of fifths. So if you just keep playing whole, whole half, whole, whole half, whoops, sorry, I'm getting, trying to talk, I'm trying to chew gum and walk at the same time. So we got, and then, and then uh, where we lead off and so on. And if we repeat that pattern, we eventually cycle back around. If we started at C, we eventually make that a little smaller, cycle back around to C again, because music is inherently cyclical. And that's why this, the next symmetries are possible because of that cyclical nature. So really what that means is that if we put in these lines of translational symmetry, because the pattern eventually loops around, you have these lines of translational symmetry separating the different tetrachord segments, the four note segments that make up the major scales and the major scales all overlap into this daisy chain sequence. And when that happens, we end up with the second type of symmetry, which is rotational symmetry. So remember how we showed that P and it, it pivots around the central pivot point. So <laughs> what was beautiful is we started with translational symmetry, which looked to be linear, especially if you look at a keyboard, because uh, it's laid out from left to right, you know, you can translate it or move that pattern as you go, whether you're going to the right, higher in pitch or down lower in pitch. But then when you continue on, you eventually cycle back around to where you began 
And what that highlights is the second type of uh, symmetry, which is rotational symmetry. So translational and rotational symmetry in music are closely connected. They are, in essence, two perspectives of the same type of symmetry, <laughs> which is awesome. The fact that both types of symmetry are actually just different embodiments of the same pattern. That's beautiful. So uh, the translational symmetry of tetrachords, so we have tetrachords, or the major scale segment, segments, they cycle into, and so we can just call this major scale, which is foundational to music. That turns into the circle of fifths, which is another foundational pattern. The circle of fifths is so fundamental to music. The fact that it's relegated to the footnotes and it's kind of like this, ooh, it seems like an advanced topic. I, When I first got into music lessons and <laughs> I asked about the circle of fifths, it was, it was traditional music teachers. And so to be fair, they just didn't know how, how it worked. And so it seemed like it was this abstract concept to them when really it shouldn't be the footnote, it should be the, the preface to the book. Uh, you know, if it was the Bible, it should be the book of Genesis. Like that's in the beginning, there was the circle of fifths. So the circle of fifths is foundational and the circle of fifths is, is super foundational and it's also built on this inherent symmetry. And so again, if you have someone who's telling you about music and and they mention, you mention, hey, do you know about the symmetry of music or the geometry of music? And they're like, um, not necessarily know what's that. What do they know? Uh, because that it's it's like so foundational. Like I say, it is hidden though, because especially when it starts with this translational symmetry, which is a little more, it's a more obscure type of symmetry. And so you don't necessarily think of symmetry in that case. But once we get to this cyclical uh, rotational symmetry, then we can get into the next type, which is reflectional symmetry. And that is basically going to bring us to the, to type right, I'm not typing, I'm writing chromatic scale, which is the third of the three foundational patterns. And we'll look at that, but together, these three, these three patterns are like the holy trinity of music. Uh, they are super important and they're all basically different reincarnations of the same patterns and these symmetries are all intricately connected what does that mean let's look at it so we have the circle of fifths and now i've applied the color as we use here with color music because this daisy chain pattern of major scales eventually cycles back and repeats itself and just as all of the major scales overlap uh, to form the circle of fifths, all of the colors in the color wheel bleed seamlessly into one another. Red leads to red orange, red orange leads to orange, orange leads to orange yellow, and so on. Uh, and I talk about this in other videos in more detail, but for example, C, uh, the C major scale is made up of equal halves of the two scales on either side. It's the second half of F, and it's also the first half of uh, the first half of G comes from C. So all of these tetrachords overlap. And that's why, for example, C, you have purple, red, and red, orange, because both of the flanking or adjacent keys are related. Likewise, red, orange is made up of equal parts, uh, red and orange, and so on all the way around the circle. Okay, so we've applied the color to this rotational symmetry, and you can see the, the, the lines of translational symmetry like spokes radiating out, radiating out around this central pivot point of rotational symmetry. So translational and rotational symmetry. And if we take these 12 colors of the color wheel, or basically the 12 keys of the circle of fifths, and we condense them down, we have just this, this circle of fifths. We got rid of all the individual notes of the tetrachords of the major scales that constructed this pattern. Now we're just looking at the 12 fundamental pitches or notes or keys of the circle of fifths in a uh, cyclical pitch space, which just means it's, it's the, we're not talking about octaves. We're just talking about the, at, at the most basic level, these are the 12 that we're working with. Then if we take every other note, so for example, all of the circles, so all of these six notes that are 
uh, separated by tritones, and we have all of the tritones swap places with each other, we have this rotational uh, rearrangement of the circle of fifths into the chromatic scale. So now, for example, C was flanked by F and G in the circle of fifths. Now C is across from F and G in the chromatic scale. And because it's cyclical and symmetrical, music is cyclical and symmetrical at its most foundational level, you have the same relationships uh, apply across the board. It's it's the same for all of them. You know, you have uh, purple red is across from, or sorry, that's blue purple is across from blue and purple, orange yellow is across from orange and yellow, and so on. You have this uh, symmetry that is going to lead to the third type of symmetry, which is reflectional symmetry. Mirror symmetry is another name for it. And it's the kind of symmetry that we, uh, I say we, I'll speak of myself in the third person, but I think other people can relate to this. Reflectional symmetry is what we often think of in terms of symmetry. So what does that mean? Well, uh, and, and the, the colors and the shapes highlight this. You can see, for example, that from C, which is a square in this case, we go out a half step in either direction, we have circles. So we can draw a half step out. A whole step in either direction, we have squares. And then, you know, a whole and a half step, one and a half steps away from this, let's call this the tonic or interval one. Then we have circles again. And then we have two whole steps. We have these squares. And then a perfect fifth and a perfect fourth. We have circles again. And then the tritone, tri meaning three and tone, whole tones. So one, two, three whole tones away, we have the tritone. So there's this symmetry, and we could do this in either direction. One, two, three. It's a tritone moving in either direction. Within cyclical pitch, pitch space, it's especially to see this reflectional symmetry. So we now we have this mirror symmetry. So we started with translational symmetry to build the, the major scales that then turned into rotational symmetry in the circle of fifths. And then when we rotated the circle of fifths in the chromatic scale, and now are dissecting the chromatic scale and the relationships between notes. And we're just treating C as the tonic here as the one, but this applies to all of the keys. This same symmetry is consistent. And whoops, you can see it when uh, you, oh, this is actually just a nice clean version of what I was trying to do, uh, or what I was illustrating up above is you have these, it's like this radiation of symmetry, where in this case, the line of symmetry of reflectional symmetry is down the middle between the tonic and its tritone or interval one, which I kind of covered up with my lines here and flat five, sharp four, flat five. So that's the reflectional symmetry around C. But again, because music is cyclical and symmetrical, the same patterns that formed uh, the, uh, the, the C major scale also form the G major scale, form the D major scale. And so you can see how if we started at any given note, these are, you know, you have the, let me try this with a different color. So stands out a little better. Um, you have the half steps and the whole steps and the one and a half steps, the two whole steps, the perfect five, perfect four, and we have the tritone from C, but we could do that same thing. Let me erase those lines. You know what? Let me leave those lines and then change the color and do it from, for example, D flat. So we have uh, a half step on either side, and then we have a whole step on either side and one and a half steps and two whole steps from D flat and a perfect five and a perfect four and a tritone. So we have the same symmetrical relationships or in this case, reflectional, the mirror symmetry around one key also applies to the key, the neighboring key. And we could go through and do that for D and E flat and E and F and so on. So as a result, we have this intricate matrix, this web of elegant symmetries that connect all of this. It kind of looks like a dream catcher or some, you know, a, a mandala. Like it's like this beautiful, beautiful symmetry that is more than just beautiful. So yes, we're talking about visually how nice it is, but this symmetry informs everything in music. So if we were to break those patterns down uh, into six, oh, let me go back to my black highlighter. We have six symmetries, tritones, which form this kind of asterisk. Then we have perfect fourths and perfect fives, which are kind of form like a star shape. And then we have triangles of thirds and flat sixths. 
Uh, so for example, from C, we have this major third to E or a flat six to E flat. And likewise from E, we have this major third to A flat, G flat or uh, G sharp and over to C. And, and so it's, it's symmetrical around all of the notes. And then likewise, we have squares of flat thirds and sixths. We have hexagons of seconds and flat sevenths and a dodecagon, which is a fancy name for the chromatic scale, which is just a series of half steps. And those are built from intervals of flat two and seven. So I know I'm kind of speaking fast here and there's a, we go into way more detail in other videos and we'll dive into these individually in other live streams. And of course, in the course within the library, uh, all of this is spelled out in a lot of detail, with lots of illustrations and diagrams and text, uh, quizzes, exercises, all that. But just to kind of give you a sense of how this framework of, of symmetry is foundational to music. Again, beyond just pretty diagrams, if you take these interval patterns and you apply them to the fretboard, we have, you know, patterns of in the key of C, uh, where we have the tonic and its tritone, they form these like cool patterns up and down the fretboard. Likewise, uh, a tonic with its fourth and fifth or subdominant and dominant form these patterns. And like I say, I have diagrams for all the keys and all of the patterns in every key, but it's more than we're, we're getting at these beautiful symmetries, but they're not just for head knowledge, they're for hands knowledge because they inform how your fingers actually move across the fretboard and then combine these patterns to create scales, modes, chords, and progressions. And it's all because these patterns are predictable because they're symmetrical. It, music is geometry. It's one thing to say music is geometry, and it's another thing to show how this geometry is inevitable. It's inescapable because at its heart, music is symmetrical based on these three types of symmetries, translational, rotational, and reflectional. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Yeah. So all of these, and the cool thing is the fretboard in, in lesson 16 uh, of part five, which I haven't published yet because lesson 16 is part of part five, uh, which I'm now working on lesson 19 of 20. Uh, and I'm going to be releasing those uh, once they're all completed, which is coming up uh, in the next couple of months. And this pattern is amazing because it is this, crazy matrix or array that incorporates all of these symmetries, but in another format. So rather than being cyclical or rather than being linear, like on a keyboard, they're all jam packed into this matrix of, uh, <laughs> of overlapping patterns. And that's why you can pick out scales and pick out chords in every single key because they all follow the same predictable patterns. I talk about this in other videos, but like caged chords, for example, are, you know, it's predictable. They form this the sequence of chord shapes and inversions because it's based on this underlying symmetry. So if we were to go back to the bad old days of black and white notation, which some people still live in this world and um, it's, it's a slog and also not illuminating, uh, you know, if, you know, now that you've seen the the symmetry it's like having visited the land of oz and then going back to kansas and not not ever having had that experience your world would be so uh limited and bland um but now that you understand that there's this symmetry there's this geometry and this logic and order to music this kind of becomes untenable uh it is it's so uh, it's so lacking that it's it's painful once you know that it's painful. And then likewise, even with diagrams like this, like this, the symmetry then becomes hidden again. Um, so why leave it hidden when you can actually see it, which is music theory by definition to see sound. So symmetry really does help you master music theory quickly. Uh, you know, again, back to the metaphor of if you were a physicist and you had never heard of gravity, you're your days would be more frustrating and confusing and mysterious. Like, oh, wow, how, how does that work? You know, how, how, how can I calculate, you know, the, the movement of objects through space? If you didn't understand gravity, um, you would you ultimately kind of miss the mark and you'd be missing a major piece of the puzzle. 
Uh, just like with music theory, if you didn't know that it was built on a framework of symmetry, it, it would be more disorienting because you're missing a major piece to the puzzle. And it's really not a puzzle. Uh, it's not so puzzling once you know that. So in summary, we have three types of symmetry. Translational symmetry, which really informs the major scale and how the major scales, the tetrachords of major scales form this repeating pattern. Then you have the tetrachords that ultimately wrap into a loop of the circle of fifths, which highlights the rotational symmetry of music. And then once you uh, rearrange the circle of fifths into the chromatic scale and dissect the chromatic scale, having already gone through those other symmetries, the reflectional symmetry highlights the basic relationships between notes, not only within one key, but between keys so that you can really start to cook with oil, as they say, and build patterns uh, more quickly because it doesn't seem it's when I first got into music, it all seemed so random. Like I thought you just took a few notes, put them together and hoped that they would sound good when really there's a logic and an order to it. And that logic and order to connecting patterns and building patterns that sound good it's because it's because it's symmetry <laughs> because it's geometry and together these three fundamental patterns are the holy trinity of music that inform everything uh, the major scale more than just the major scale it informs all of the modes in music which is what i just completed lesson 18 about which again i'll be uh, publishing when lesson five comes out and then the circle of fifths which is shamefully relegated to the footnotes uh in a lot of a lot of musical teaching when really it should be the introduction and then the chromatic scale which is the mother of all note patterns and that we actually use the chromatic scale to play patterns and the chromatic scale is informed by the circle of fifths and the circle of fifths is informed by the chromatic scale and the chromatic scale comes from the or the major scale sorry and then the major scale comes from the uh, chromatic scale so it's kind of this like self-referential fractal relationship between patterns it's symmetrical so that i think is oh yeah yeah this is one diagram that i just want to show that kind of summarizes it this is in lesson two of the course um and we could just spend time on this diagram <laughs> alone but this shows the holy trinity of music i'm going to zoom in and just look at the first part we have the chromatic scale in this inner ring there are three concentric rings we have i'll uh i'll remove these lines in a sec but you have this inner ring of the chromatic scale which is basically just a series of half steps and then you have the major scales which is the whole whole half whole whole half it's the tetrachords that are built upon that and then you have the uh circle of fifths let me zoom out a little bit that is every fifth note from that and it forms this ring of harmonic harmonically related keys so let me undo those lines but that's in essence what we're looking at in this circle of fifths and so much of the time the circle of fifths is depicted as this ring of key signatures using traditional notation and so it's a the focus is on oh, okay we have one sharp in the key of g so we have a key signature oh, let's just do a simple version you have a key signature with one sharp because we're focusing on that one sharp and then in the key of d we have this f sharp and we have a c sharp so in the key of d we have an f sharp and a c sharp and you go down the line or likewise you have you know in the key of c there are no sharps or flats in the key of f there's this one b flat and so we're going to put a key signature with a flat for b flat b flat has b flat and e flat so it has uh, two flats and so the focus is on what seems to be <clears throat> pardon me asymmetry choking on my own spit here the focus of the traditional circle of fifths is on the apparent asymmetry the differences between keys instead of what is clearly a an identical sequence a pattern of symmetry that connects all of the keys and so we'll get into the pitfalls and problems with traditional notation in other videos but this just highlights what a chasm there is between traditional notation and how limiting it is it puts on the blinders it puts on the conceptual and literal blinders in terms of seeing these patterns and then with 
as we can see with color music and with the symmetry of, of music, how, oh, wow, all of these patterns are totally predictable because they're based on a sequence of, of half steps, whole steps and half steps, and then fifths that, that show how they're all interconnected. And this is one version of showing how these three patterns are the holy trinity of music because they're all reincarnations of the same thing. They're just different views of what is, in essence, the same patterns. So, all right, uh, that's, that is the symmetry of music in a nutshell, like I say, uh, more on this in the library and certainly in the course, um, but let's jump into some of the comments. So, uh, physiognomy professor, I like your name, uh, translational being a diminished scale or a whole tone scale. So, okay, uh, let's look at a whole tone scale, for example. So I'm gonna go here and uh, you have, so for example, if you can see my keyboard, so, uh, whole steps um yeah i mean you do have in essence uh symmetry certainly with this where there's a line right here the fourth the subdominant is uh, uh the line of symmetry where you repeat this pattern and then repeat this pattern across now the tritone of f which is b and so on um, but the whole tone scale is part of, it's basically like here we have the squares and the circles. And so let me see if I can come back to, well, I know I can, cause I'm just going to scroll over to this other image. Um, when we have, my lines are still on this image. Let me see if I can erase the lines. Oh, hold on. That's kind of weird. Okay. Well, I got rid of some of the lines. So we have like a whole tone scale oh, of whole steps. And that is one half of the relationship that turns the circle of fifths into the chromatic scale. And so the symmetry is still there. But as far as your question on translational symmetry, um, you know, the whole tone scale is fundamental in that it highlights this relationship between the circle of fifths and the chromatic scale, which are two of two uh, beings in the Holy Trinity of music, uh, the translational symmetry of the major scale, which is fundamental to the formation of the circle of fists in the first place, um, that is specifically the emphasis here. But yeah, these, these symmetries appear, these symmetries show up like in all the different modes as well. Like you have reflectional symmetry, for example, between Ionian and Phrygian, they're just reverses of the whole steps and half steps. This symmetry, this all different types of symmetry are imbued at every level uh, with the different patterns. Um, that's a good question. William, hey, it's cool to see you on. So the lines of symmetry are always whole steps between the tetra chords. Um, between the tetra chords, yes. So let's go to, um, yeah, let me see if I can clean up this image. I don't know if I can. Um, I might be able to, well, let me, it's kind of funky what it's doing there. Hold on. Let's see if I can get to another. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is a little cleaner. Um, we have a whole step, yes, between, <laughs> let me get my pen. We have a whole step between F and G, so that's a whole step. And then we have a whole step from C to D, that's a whole step. A whole step from G to A, that's a whole step. And so that's the thing about the, um, oh, it's right here. Hold on. Well, I'm going to draw it down below this diagram, but you have um, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. That's the formula that, that people say, and, and there's probably mnemonics for it because it's just rote memorization for a lot of people. But if you look at it, you're like, hmm, that seems asymmetrical because I used to think of the major scale pattern as being whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. This is This is like, you know, like a, a, a regular sized car this is a sedan and this is a limo <laughs> like why is it why is one size bigger than the other or one side bigger than the other when you really know it's actually a tetrachord with the line of translational symmetry down the whole step with the nether tetrachord and you do the same thing whole whole half and so on so you have and this would be another hole so this would be the start of the next pattern so yes long answer to a short question the the line of translational symmetry goes down that seemingly extra whole step in the major scale formula. 
Uh, Keenan Music, cool. It's cool to see you on. So I just want to say thank you for bringing the system of learning music theory to the world. Thank you. Um, this has helped me write like 50, not even exaggerating my own songs. That is awesome. That And that is totally what it is about. So here, you know, we're diving into seemingly pedantic, you know, the realm of symmetry. And, you know, we could get out our pocket calculator and put tape on our glasses and, and, and nerd out. But there is a practical application to all of this. this. All this head knowledge is meant to translate into to hands knowledge. So thank you for your feedback. And that is super cool. I love it. Um, that's what it's all about is music theory for songwriting, not just for the sake of theory. But theory could be, you know, it's fun just to kind of dive into theory. I love theory as much as music, frankly, because they're just flip sides of the same coin. Uh, but to turn it into theory or turn it into to music, turn that theory into music is, is beautiful. That's awesome. And, and thank you for being here at, at Keen Music. You have really good insights. Uh, and uh, you've even just with the patterns you've played, like on, I, I can't remember if it was here or it might have been a, a Q&A open hour where you were sharing emojis of patterns. We were playing them. They sound really good. Uh, it's cool that you can make music with emojis. So that is the symmetry of music in a nutshell. Um, like I say, there's more detail and uh, I <laughs> in, in the course. And so uh, definitely check that out. We'll be diving into this in more detail as we go. And uh, there's a lot from part five that I haven't really rolled out because, like I say, the paint is still wet on that. So I'm going to be uh, there's a lot to cover uh, as that com comes out. So thanks for geeking out with me. It's awesome, as always. And I will see you really soon. Have a good rest of your night, day, morning, wherever you might be. <laughs> we'll see you. Bye.